You're listening to the Law of Attraction Radio Network. International success coach and noted author, Constance Arnold, delivers life-changing strategies through her own spiritual practices, as well as with best-selling authors and experts that she interviews. Think, Believe, and Manifest is specially designed to empower your mind and words to work for you and to bring about a life you've been dreaming of. And now, here's Constance Arnold. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Law of Attraction Radio Network. And of course, I am Constance Arnold, host of the Think, Believe, and Manifest Talk Show. And today I am broadcasting from beautiful, wonderful, magnificent Atlanta, Georgia. So grateful that you've joined me from all over the world today. And you know, I just believe that it's a set up by the Spirit to attract you here so that you can receive the downloads, the insight, you know, that one aha moment that you've been searching for. And I always say that all it takes is one idea, one connection, one word from God to literally change your life. I'm a living witness. Well, hello, everyone. How are you doing today? I'm doing really, really well here in the ATL Hey, that rhymes, doesn't it? (laughs) Well, uh, thank you again for joining my show. Uh, We're going to get right to it. I have a wonderful show for you. What would you do if you were in a car accident and uh, you were paralyzed from the waist down? For the rest of your life, would you give up? What what would you do? Well, my very special guest, Mr. David Rippey, is going to talk to us about, you know, how do you push through tough times? Uh, How do you begin to get a new vision? And how do you begin to set goals for your life in the midst of difficult circumstances? I can't wait to hear what he has to say. Well, I'm going to answer a, a question from a listener, but before I do, I want you to make sure that you visit my website, fulfillingyourpurpose.com. Take a look at my coaching videos. If you're interested in coaching with me, you can do a, uh, we can do a 20-minute discovery call just so you can uh, You can call me, speak to me, share your vision, and uh, I can see and you can see if we might be a vibrational match. I coach everyone from CEOs to a housewife who is ready to get back into the marketplace. You know, these are changing times. So if you are searching for a relationship, want to learn how to use the law of attraction more effectively, desire to lose weight, it's all an inside job. I'm going to teach you how to change your core beliefs, your paradigms, etc. So visit my website. Also, uh, if this show is and has been a blessing to you, I'm thanking you in advance for your gift, your donation. What you're doing is paying it forward. You know, I was telling somebody, I think it was a client uh, just last week, the quickest way, and I don't know if I fully understand it all, but the quickest way to get things moving in your life is to give. It doesn't have to be money, but just give. Give a smile, give a compliment, give your time, give kindness, because it puts you in the law of circulation. Every day, I I, I intentionally say, Who can I give to? How can I bless other people? So I'm thanking you in advance for that. And of course, follow me on my social media platforms, uh, Twitter and um, Instagram is LOA Constance and Facebook is Coach with Constance. Every Monday morning at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, I am giving a Facebook Live. So you can watch, you can ask me your questions, you can join other people from all over the world. Let's see, is there anything else? I want to answer this listener's question. Like I said, I I don't know what David is going to be talking about, but I think this question will be in line with what he shares. 
Uh, this is a male listener, and I'm just going to read you the gist of his email. He says that his emotional and psychological being has really been impacted the last six months because of COVID-19. He feels like he's lost his vision. He doesn't know if he still wants to do the same thing. He's working from home. He doesn't really like that. He prefers working in the office. So his whole world has been rocked, et cetera. And he wants to know how can he get his purpose and his vision back? Well, let me just acknowledge, thank you so much for your question. And I'm going to ask all listeners to really open yourself up to hear what I feel might even help you. First of all, I think we have to acknowledge what has happened. This has been a big shift. This has been a change. For some of you, it has been scary, you know, so uncertain. Some people call it a new normal, et cetera. So I think that has to be an acknowledgement of it. I think that when we hold it in and try to handle everything ourselves, that it's just not emotionally and psychologically healthy. I know for me personally, it has been a major adjustment for my life. You know, for me personally, of course, we are getting back out there connecting. But I think for people to experience something like this and not know that it has had a psychological and an emotional, a financial, uh, a career impact on our lives, that that has to be acknowledged. I think the second thing is that you have to begin to understand that spirit of God really wants to give you a new vision for your life. Uh, a lot of people talk about getting back to the old normal. You and I know that there were some things in our lives that we should have left behind. Some people, some mindsets, some ways of thinking, some positions, some, you know, just some some everyday routines in our lives that uh, we know were not working for us, but we were in our comfort zone. But now that uh, COVID-19 has happened, we, we're not forced, but you, this gentleman and all of us have to really take a look at our lives. So you acknowledge what has, has happened. You examine and take a look. What did I need to leave behind anyway? I think you have to sit still and be honest with yourself. I know I had to do that. Uh, personally, you know, most of you guys know for the last 25 years, I've been flying out to meet, to teach, to train. That was my lifestyle. You know, getting on a plane here in the ATL, the busiest airport in the world, developing training modules, etc. So all of a sudden, that abruptly stopped. So I had to shift my mindset. It's a way of living, you know, where I live now. I sort of moved in this area so I could be closer to the airport. Everybody feel me on that? So I had to sit with it, sir. I had to sit with God. What is the newness that you have for me? And uh, I, I like I like being virtual. Uh, I will do some more in-person training and coaching, but I, I have adjusted and I sort of like it. It has great advantages. I reach more people. A lot of my international listeners uh, uh, will be able to participate. I just had a seminar uh, this weekend and a lot of people who could not fly in or I could not fly to them uh, can participate. I've met more people. I've connected with different people. So you got to take a look at that. I have more time at home now to develop deeper relationships. I can really put into place a lot more of my lifestyle living. So I think you got to sit and be honest with yourself. Um, I, I think also sit down and write down, you know, just get real with yourself. What in your past you know wasn't working, but you just did not let it go? Uh, how has your mindset changed, et cetera? So you almost kind of like have to do an inventory <clears throat> and sit down. You don't have to know the, the how. I got that out. 
So what, sir, what do you want in your life like right now? How do you want your career to look? What do you want your life to look like? And so we're so used to doing instead of being. I was with Grant Accounts this week for lunch, and she said being is doing. That's profound. That's a whole nother show. But, sir, I would say to you, sit and just be still and acknowledge this is what I want. I don't want to work longer hours. I want to spend more time with my family. I want to start my own business on the side. You don't have to know how. So allow yourself to take inventory. How do you want your marriage to be? Speaking of marriage and relationships, a lot of stuff that has been in your life, if you're married or if you're in a relationship with your partner, has been revealed. Because whatever is in you during hard times will certainly come out. I tell you. And so just allow the spirit to come into you and teach you and speak to you. Now, that may take a one week, two weeks, three weeks. You sit every day and you just write down authentically what do you really want. And the thing that I want all of you to remember is that God loves to be with you in what you consider the low places of your life. You know, the Bible says my grace is sufficient, not just sufficient when things are going great, but grace is sufficient when you feel weak, when you feel uncertain, when you feel fearful, when you don't know what to do. All right, and then um, I think you need to remember that as you write down what you desire, you're really painting a picture. You're creating a picture of what you desire for your life. Remember, you don't have to know how. Sit with that. Allow your imagination to begin to imagine the new career, the new position, your new lifestyle. What would your new lifestyle look like? What would it feel like? What would it look like on a daily basis? How would it impact your children? How would it impact your wife? How happy would you be? How could that new lifestyle bring more purpose into your life? You know, on Facebook Live last week, I talked about doing it afraid and scared. And so, sir, and all of you, any new uh, change, any new mindset, initially you might be a little fearful about it. You might be a little afraid. Oh, my God, how am I going to do that? But just begin to take baby steps every day in the general direction of what you think you desire. I tell people, go general first, and then we can get specific. I want to have a more balanced lifestyle, because that's very general. Then we can add the specifics to it. I will stop working, uh, doing work from my computer at home at 5 p.m. That's adding more specifics. I will exercise three times a week for 20 minutes. More specifics. I will drink a green drink (laughs) twice a week. Can you see that? So, sir, just go in the general direction uh, of what you want because I want everybody to hear this. You have to get your your desire in your consciousness first and then it will out picture in your life and you'll know what action to take. So the reason you are sitting with this desire is you're getting it in your consciousness. You're thinking it, you're feeling it, you're talking about it. You're painting a picture in your mind many times even before you take inspired action. And then from that inner place, sir, begin to take consistent baby step actions in the new direction. Let it be fun. Let it be like a discovery, like an exploration. You're going to try this. You're going to think about this. You're going to believe this. You're going to consider this. So that's how you're going to see it. And remember that God has greater for you. I said on a post this week that God has 
a million pathways to get your abundance to you, sir. That there are a million ways that God can get to you what you desire. Who can fathom the ways of God? I love that verse. And so those are just some specific tips. Uh, sir, I hope that, that that helps you and it helps all of, of my listeners. You know, I'm going to take my own advice. So that's how you get your vision back. You know, don't let this COVID-19 just shake you. Let it shift you so that you can manifest your highest dreams your highest goals, uh, so that you can begin to change your mindset. So it's all good. Your best years are ahead of you. Well, all right, everybody, that was so good. I'm going to listen to that again myself. So we are going to go to these quick commercials, and then I'm going to be right back with to hear the amazing story of, of David Rippey, and uh, you're going to be so blessed. So stay tuned, everybody. Do you have an upcoming event where you need a dynamic speaker? Constance Arnold is a sought-after keynote speaker that will enlighten the entire audience with proven strategies that are aligned with your organization's vision and mission. An experienced speaker for major Fortune 500 companies, Constance has entertained audiences with inspiring change. Constance would love to make your next event an extraordinary success. Contact her today at Constance at FulfillingYourPurpose.com. For the past 30 years, Constance Arnold has coached clients globally in the areas of relationships, wealth, and career. Her vast clinical background gives her extraordinary understanding of human behavior to accelerate manifestation. Every coaching client receives proven action plans to create change from the inside out. Constance will be right by your side. Talk to her today at Constance at FulfillingYourPurpose.com. Everybody, I am back and we have a very special guest today. I'm just going to give a short introduction of who he is, but my very special guest, and you're going to be blessed, is Mr. David Rippey. And David is an international author. He's authored five books. He's a speaker, and he really is uh, all about helping people to live their best lives at the age of 25 in the midst of a, a, a great career. Uh, Dave's life changed dramatically when he was involved in the car accident that left him paralyzed from the shoulders down. But despite all of that, despite uh, that life-altering uh, injury, he has um, maintained or formulated a vision for his life, and he's going to teach us how to do that today. He continued to spread his message of positivity through writing and speaking engagements, and he believes that there are more miracles to come in his life and works toward new goals and aspirations every day. So, Mr. David Rippey, welcome to the Law of Attraction Radio Network. Well, thanks, Constance. Thanks for having me. And, uh, you know, I appreciate and admire the work you do. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of good, positive people out there, and you're one of them. Well, uh, thank you. Well, well you know, uh, I, was, I was kidding, uh, David, behind the scenes, because we've been trying to do this for a couple of times, but I call it divine time in David. And, uh, I just believe that your story is one for today, and I'm, I have lots of questions for you that I believe that will really empower our listeners. Well, good. You want to go ahead and start with some questions? I, or? I do. Well, David, tell us a little bit about your journey and, and your accident and your life and how that has impacted you, et cetera. Well, God, since I was, uh, you know, my early 20s, I was involved in an automobile accident, which left me paralyzed from the shoulders down. And prior to that time, I was a student down in Texas, went to school at Texas a and University and graduated, and then came back up here in uh, the East Coast and took a job with a Fortune 50 company. And three weeks into that new position, uh, I was in the woods. Uh, the car was crumpled around me. A friend of mine was driving and hit a dead deer on the road, mm. which, which threw the car into the woods. And subsequently, my neck snapped, and I broke my neck. 
And prior to that, I was pretty athletic. I mean, I could, you know, I could uh, run a mile five and a half minutes and bench about 325 pounds. I played sports in high school and got uh, intramurals in college. So it was quite a devastating blow to somebody whose life was a lot of it was centered around sports and activities. So from that moment, when I slid down in that car and I couldn't move again, my shoulders were my, my arms were my legs. It was very surreal. It was, uh, it was almost like I was in a, uh, a bad dream. And I mm-hmm. kept sh- you know, trying to move and move for about half an hour while my friend went to get help. And um, you know, I just realized that 30 minutes I was alone in those woods and the windows were blown out. And the roof was caved in around my head. And uh, it was about cold. It was like early, I mean, excuse me, early November. So at that moment, I just thought, wow, this is a life-changing event. And, um, you know, it just took some time to move forward after that. Yeah. And, and, and you know, I, I love your attitude because I've read everything about you and, and I've been um, listening to you, you know, on social media and on YouTube. And, and so, David, you know, you, you're just the person for, for this season. So after your accident, did you set goals? How, how did you... How did you adapt to the change, I guess would be my first question. How did you adjust and adapt to the change, which is what a lot of people are having to do now? Well, it was uh, quite a moment. I mean, uh, you know, when they got me out of the woods, I had to go through six months of rehab and uh, surgery and things like this. And they had to put a steel ring around my head. It was uh, quarter inch, It was drilled in with quarter-inch screws, which were held in place for three months. So you know, very, very uncomfortable. So I had to go through all this. And the goal was getting out of the hospital. That was really the goal I set first because I knew that, you know, I couldn't move forward in my life if I uh, was surrounded by medical equipment, nurses running in and out all the time. And, you know, I want to get my life back. So I worked to get out of the hospital and rehab. So once I got out, I was back home again at my parents' house. And I'd only been there three weeks. And then I was gone six months. And now I'm back, in, you know, now. So what I did, Constance, that you alluded to, I set goals. And the reason I set goals, because I knew where I was. I was at point A, sitting at home, once athletic and walking at six feet two, and now I'm down at four eight in a wheelchair and paralyzed. So I'd really set goals. But first I really had to figure out what can I do? And I knew what I couldn't do. I couldn't do a lot of things. I couldn't drive a truck. I couldn't uh, – you know, I could uh, really be a salesman. It'd be too much uh, running around in a car on the road. I couldn't drive because of my paralysis. Um, you know, I couldn't be a Navy SEAL, an astronaut, even though that probably wasn't going to happen anyway. But I decided that I wanted to be a money manager. So that seemed like a, you know, a far away goal. Like, how the heck am I going to do that? And to make it even more difficult was I knew absolutely no one that was in the uh, money management business. I didn't have any friends, family, uh, friends of my parents, or anybody that you know could have maybe given me some information. So I'd be kind of doing it on my own. And this was uh, kind of the dawning of the Internet. It's not like it is today where we go online and find information on anything or videos on anything. So it was more or less a lot of uh, just reading and magazines and, uh, you know, newspapers about, uh, you know, which firms might be hiring. But to get there, I knew I needed to set some goals. I didn't have quite enough education to ma- manage other people's money. I had a Bachelor of Science and Economics from Texas a and but that wasn't enough to really understand the complexities of, you know, the, the markets and the world. So I had to go back to school, and I knew that was one goal. So I decided to start taking courses Kind of at night, you know, after, uh, you know, the community college, uh, actually, no, excuse me, another university that specialized in like graduate type level courses. So we took some in portfolio management. And another goal I had to set was I needed assistance now. I never needed assistance before, you know, obviously besides parents help me with uh, school and things like that. But now I was physically dependent on people. So I needed to hire people that I could go with me to not only help me with my physical needs, but at the same time, be able to manage uh, and help me in a high paced brokerage environment, you know, filling out stock and bond orders and things and talking to clients. So I knew I needed somebody extra special. So I looked around the local colleges and looked for people that 
you know, students that had, um, you know, juniors and seniors in college that were into finance and accounting and, you know, things like this, they uh, hired them and then they were able to transition with my health care. My health care wasn't that big a deal. Even though I'm paralyzed from the neck down, the health care really involved, you know, being my hands, being my feet, going around the office, you know, dealing with things, driving my uh, van. And that was another goal. That I need. I need a large transport vehicle. My chair with me in it weighs about 400 and some pounds. And, um, you know, you just couldn't drive around in a car anymore. I couldn't transfer because I couldn't use my legs. So I had to have a car with a big heavy duty lift to be able to lift the chair up, get inside that van and get me to the office. So those were three out of the four goals. The fourth goal was I knew I needed work experience. I'd only been out of college a couple of weeks, you know, looking up on my resume, here's what, you know, not a lot of jobs as most uh, college students don't have, unless I get a good internship. So I knew I needed more work-related experience. So I took a job at Vanguard Group near me, which uh, it helped them in their marketing department, talking to clients about mutual funds, about different funds and, you know, why we buy this equity fund or this bond fund and, you know, how the world events might be affecting their investments. So these are the kind of things we learn. So when I had all that together, I'd also acquired my Series 7 license, which is the brokerage license required to trade stocks and bonds. And I got that at the Vanguard Group. So on my resume now, what it showed was this. It, it not only had I done what I needed to do but time the scenes, in other words, hiking in the van, getting the right assistance trained to help me with physical and uh, financial work needs. But at this point, I also had more education. So I started on my resume. It showed that I you know, was working toward like a master's degree. It showed that I had industry-related work experience because I was working at Vanguard, which is you know, the largest mutual fund company in the world now. So all the people out there I was going to apply to saw that on there. I also... Uh, I also, uh, behind the scenes, uh, work on some interviews. Like, it's important to practice before you go to an interview. I mean, the interviewers today have gotten tougher than they were back then. Back then, it was a question like, you know, what are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? Right. You know, we can always take a weakness and say, well, I tend to go to work too hard sometimes, which really makes it look like a strength. But today, the questions have, uh, you know, got a lot more complex. And I think it, uh, for the person out interviewing, I think it's very important that they practice, uh, practice uh, question and answer sessions with interviewers. So those were the goals I had set. And after setting those goals of getting assistance in place that could help me, getting the ban in place that could drive me, getting the education in place so I knew what I was, you know, I had a better idea what to talk about. And fourth, having showing that um, employers that, you know, even though I'm sitting here in a wheelchair, paralyzed from the shoulders down, that I think I can help your company and be a, be a contributor to the bottom line and help bring some money in new clients. And one thing I did on my resume, Constance, in the cover letter, I didn't make any reference of my disability. Mm. I didn't tell client. I didn't tell any, any employers. I didn't say... Hey guys, you know, I'm, you know, I've done a lot since I've been hurt. It's been about, you know, six months to a year now, but I am paralyzed. I just wanted you to know that. And I didn't think that was important. I thought it was important to let the, let the interviewer see a resume that showed work experience, show that I was uh, pursuing a higher education, you know, which they like to see. And then I was ready and able to go to work and this, that. So when I showed up for the interviews, uh, they would, they came in here. I come in there and see a guy, drive, you know, in a wheelchair, you know, looking, you know, the tie on and all that, of course. But uh, some of them were a little shocked. And I found it was important for anybody out there listening that might be uh, looking to interview and they might have a disability or, uh, you know, have more issues than others as far as, uh, you know, appearances or whatever. I explained the mechanisms of my chair. The, uh, I have a sip and puff chair, which means I have this tube type thing in front of my face, which I can blow in and make the chair go left or right or backwards or forward. So it's very handy. But to somebody just looking at it that aren't aware of this type of technology, they simply see something that looks like uh, I'm going to take a breath or a drink out of it. Right. So I, yeah. So I found Constance, it was very important to let any prospective employers up front know that this is a chair, this is what this thing's for, this is not oxygen, I'm fine. 
And I'm not going to drink out of it. It makes the chair move. So once I got that out of their minds, and I can bring them back to focus on why I wanted a job there. So I think it's important uh, when we're out in the world, and I think it's good for all of us to uh, realize, your listeners, is that if uh, there's something that might distract, if there's something that might draw an audience or a person's attention away from where we want to focus, then it's good to kind of uh, bring their mind back in a way that, you know, kind of answers those questions or thinking about it at the time they're staring at you. So let me ask you this, you know, so we're going to bring it back to what's happening today to a lot of folk, you know, maybe they've have had a life altering experience of being furloughed. Maybe they are a small business owner. Maybe they are working from home and trying to, um, you know, really teach their kids virtually at the same time. So are you saying that even in the midst of that, there's something on the inside of them that could push them to begin to set daily goals. Exactly, Constance. I think, you know, we have, uh, you know, a sad situation around the world with COVID-19 today. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, there's been a lot of businesses affected from retail establishments to restaurants to airlines to hotels. I mean, the list is endless. What, uh, what I find is that uh, that's a situation that has impacted some to a greater degree than others. Some people have lost their lives through this. Some people have lost loved ones. Others have lost businesses. But Constance, yes, I think in any circumstance that we're going to face, and as humans, we're going to face a lot of challenges. We're going to face a lot of unexpected events as we go through our lives. And I think what I found for me was that sitting back, and starting a meditation practice about probably about eight, 10 years ago, has helped me to be able to sit back and maybe analyze things and maybe a way that's a little, maybe a little more objective, a little less, uh, a, a little less uh, where my own uh, thoughts, perceptions uh, might cloud what uh, the way forward. So I found the best thing to do if we use it, I used it in the hospital to help me through it. I use creative imagery. And I think if we can look at you know, these tough times. I mean, people are struggling. People are hurting now, whether it's financially or, uh, you know, through the loss of uh, loved ones or so. What I would tell them to do is I would really probably take the time to understand more about meditation. Find out why they thought it was so well. Why Buddha, when they asked him, they said, you know, what have you gained from meditation? He goes, it's not what I've gained, it's what I've lost. Mm. I've lost stress. I've lost anxiety. I have lost fear. And I think if we all sit back and realize that we're immortal beings, you know, we're, we're God, uh, we have souls, we're divine, and sit back, separate ourselves from our issues at hand, hold them in a distance, don't absorb them. And that's the key. I think when I face challenges going forward, it didn't matter if it was a wheelchair was broken or an assistant couldn't make it in. What I found is we hold the challenge, hold that trauma at a distance, don't absorb it. Mm-hmm. And find ways to solve it by being able to look at it objectively. But if we allow it to enter our world, if we allow it to absorb our lives, getting over that stress, trauma, and depression over that event is not going to help us move forward any faster. Hold that event at a distance. Keep that uh, anxiety and stress at a minimum through meditation. I think we can all move forward through, through COVID and other events we'll face. I love that. So you mentioned creative visualization. Expound on that and how can listeners, how did you use it and how can listeners implement that principle in their lives? Well, to give you one example, when I was in the hospital, I, like I mentioned, I was paralyzed. I had a steel ring around my head, which made, which was very uncomfortable. I mean, it literally arrested the back of your head on screws that are drilling your skull. So sleep was very hard to come by. So what I did was, uh, and another thing that happened was I didn't really want to sleep because it was a new situation. Mm-hmm. They were coming in and out with different suggestions or operations, and I did not want to sleep. I wouldn't be awake and cognizant, you know, before something else happened, maybe a little bit prepared. But what happened one night uh, for about a month straight, what happened is with this injury, your temperature spike at night. So what that means is my temperature would rise from about 103 to 104 degrees every single night around 7 o'clock. And that's just some part of the injury that I had no idea about, but it happened. So sleep deprivation and higher temperatures started leading to hallucinations during the day sometimes, where I would wake up suddenly after just 
you know, drifting off for seconds. And I'd see the clock spinning backwards on the wall. I would see myself somersaulting three times in bed. And mm-hmm. these were frightening events. But then it would instantly fade. I'd have my lucidity back. And then I thought, wow, I don't like that. That's never happened in my life. And losing control of my mind with these uh, strange, uh, strange visualizations I don't need. So one night, to bring the, every night for what, about a month, for to bring the temperatures down, they would have to pack my body in ice. So they would put about 25 ice bags on me. They would cover that with an ice blanket. And to bring my temperature from 103 down to, you know, something that wouldn't be destructive to my brain or my body, you know, down to 99, 98, that range. Uh, So they'd have to do that. Every two hours, they'd replace these ice bags. So one night, they would file out. Two hours later, come back to the ice bags. So one night, I was just laying there. And this is where the creative visualization came to me was I, my, every night my body would, my mind would spin. It would just start spinning like I was on a lathe, like I was blasted off into space. And that was because 103, 104 degree temps. And, uh, you know, it's just what happened. So one night, for whatever reason, I visualized this large map of the United States in my mind. And for some reason, there was a train that was here, like in, outside of Philadelphia on the East Coast. And I visualized this train going across country all the way to San Francisco. Now, the reason I picked San Francisco was I had worked there for about six months, about a year earlier in between college semesters. So what happened was when this train, uh, when my mind spinning, I noticed the train was pretty much the wheels were spinning at the same speed as my mind. So in my mind, I came up with that visualization to – if I could slow that train down from going from Philadelphia all the way across the country to San Francisco, if I could slow those wheels down and stop that train by the time we got to San Francisco, I could regain control. So that's what mm-hmm. I felt. My, that's what I felt in my mind. So I would see myself inside the train as a conductor, and I would see myself then looking down, flying way above the train, looking down at this huge map of the U.S., so I saw myself, whether after great concentration over, of course, about probably half an hour to an hour, that these wheels were slowing down. So I'm seeing this old locomotive coming across the country, first blazing out of Philadelphia like a rocket sled on wheels, seeing it slowing down through, uh, through Ohio. And once I got to Nevada, I knew I didn't have a lot of time left. So I saw it coming through Nevada, going into California, and I started doubling down my concentration to slow those wheels down. And what was interesting, Constance, as those wheels slowed down, I felt my mind slowing down as well. It wasn't spinning quite as much. Mm -hmm. So we finally arrived in San Francisco. Uh, I stopped the train about 50 yards past, ran back to the station, and then bang, my mind was totally back, and I never hallucinated the rest of my life. So what I, that was my first experience with creative imagery. But I found now, even looking at being a stockbroker, a money manager, sitting at home paralyzed, you know, knowing I'm at point A and I got to get to point B, and I know point B is on the other side of some very dark and nebulous woods. We don't know what's in those woods, but we have to get through it. So I found setting those goals helps. And I think if all of us look at it, if we have an event in our lives that changes our career, we lose that restaurant we've had, you know, just because of this virus, for example. Um, if we lose our jobs, what we want to do is like I did. I didn't have any experience whatsoever, knew nobody in the field. You want to set the goals. First pick that place you want to be. What job do I want? To keep it realistic because there's a lot of competition out there. And then work backwards from that, finding those steps backwards to your, where you're sitting now and set those goals and are stepping stones and fine tune them. You know, I didn't, I didn't hire the perfect assistant over a you know, month or two period. It takes it took about six months to get it all together. It took, of course, six months to a year to take the right courses. So we have to have patience on our journey too. And, uh, you know, Confucius said, it doesn't matter how slow you go, just don't stop. So every, oh, I love that. Yes. And every day, and I'll tell you another good one of concerts you might like, but, Every day, let's set goals. Let's let's get it. Let's work on little goals within our larger goal. And I think if we do that, I think we can find ourselves making progress and moving beyond that point where we feel stuck, where we feel depressed, where we're not happy. 
and change our lives for the better. Another thing that I, a quote I really like is Dr. Martin Luther King. And he said, faith is taking that first step, even when you don't see the whole staircase. So I think if we build our goals properly, we won't fall through that staircase and we'll find ourselves being able to make to the top of whatever mountain or area we want to accomplish. I love that. So David, how do you, were you, were you mad at God when you had your experience? And how can people move away from anger, resentment, fear, and move toward faith, toward the, the goals or the unlimited possibilities that are out there for them? Well, Constance, to tell you the truth, well, what I found is all through my journey, of course, at first we wonder, why me? Mm-hmm. Why was I the one hurt when my friend wasn't? Why did I move up here from uh, Houston when I could have stayed there? We all look at different things and whys. We look at the paths that we've chosen or the paths we end up on unexpectedly, like my car accident. And what we got to learn and what we're going to find out is that God does not do this to us. Yeah. We take challenges of our, own, of our own. Was the accident a total accident? Well, there's no such thing as time. You know, we only know that in our dimension. What we got to look at is without getting too uh, complex here, I think the main thing to consider is this, is that we are going to face constant challenges when that is how we grow and understand and learn through experience. It's only by getting back, you know, being falling down and getting back up there, we're going to learn how to get up. So I think uh, the challenges we all face are going to be different. Some are going to be horrible, but there's a lot of people out there that have much worse injuries than me. You know, they have a harder time. They might have been have my injury and be blind as well. I mean, that takes a really tough soul to go through that type of existence in life. But what I found is that, you know, we are going to have challenges. How well we respond to those challenges. If we allow ourselves to get bogged down in sadness, it's going to take us that much longer to accomplish. So we're all going to, we just have to face it. We're here on earth. You know, we, we're going to have challenges. God is not doing this to us. These are things that are kind of in our path of learning and understanding as souls as we progress. So I think, uh, I think we, you know, we don't blame, but don't blame people. I mean, obviously I had a friend in the accident. I could have blamed him for hitting the dead deer. You know, even though he didn't see it, it was foggy out and it was an accident. I think if we just kind of say, Hey, let's move beyond, let's don't cast blame, but let's see what we can show others where we can go from where we are now. In a tough situation, whether with a lost business, a lost loved one, a lost ability to move our own limbs, let's go forward and see what we can make of this. Let's rise from the ashes, recreate ourselves, and come back stronger and more and wiser than we were. You're amazing. You know, in one of your books, you have a chapter on healing with hypnosis. Explain, are you a hypnotherapist? Uh, yes, I am, Constance. Okay. Yeah, I'm actually a certified hypnotherapist. And what, what, what's interesting about that, which amazes me, is that it first started out for me that I wasn't a certified. I, but, I, but I had always wondered about life after death and things like that and all that. So I kind of uh, delved into this a little bit and learned a lot about life after death and near-death experiences and uh, always found that fascinating. People going to the light and feeling that love and bliss on the other side sometimes being snapped back down in their bodies, you know, not leaving the earth because they're not finished yet. So what I did was I did that. But then I have an assistant come over one night who couldn't move. Her, her neck was frozen. Her shoulders were locked in place and just, just a lot of pain from a sprained neck. So she goes, David, I don't, know if I, can, I don't think I can help you tonight. And I said, wow, that doesn't sound good. It was too late to call anyone else for backup. So what I ended up doing was uh, I said, you know what, let's try hypnosis. So she laid down and uh, about 45, you know, I talked her down. The pain's going away. You're not feeling it. You know, you're feeling more relaxed and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we brought her down in a hypnotic state and uh, had her sit back up. 45 minutes later, she's touching her arms with her, or her back with her hands and just looking at me kind of uh, incredulously that uh, something like that could have even happened. But she lost all her pain. So what I find is that hypnosis – is a very powerful tool. And I've been using it myself for about 10, probably about 10, 12 years now to where I've helped people uh, with pain 
And, um, you know, beyond what I do, just to show you how widespread it's become. And if we look at the Veterans Administration, for example, they've been introducing uh, hypnosis to their burn victims that have been unfortunate, you know, maybe an IED, maybe something like this, to the, for, the, for the poor warriors that have been hurt. So they've used hypnosis on burn victims. And they find that the burn will heal 40% faster and with about 50% less infection rate by just introducing hypnosis into the regular routine. That's all. Wow. So I thought I found that fascinating. So anyway, the girl, uh, like I said, girl got up 45 minutes later, lifted me up like I was a better, put me on my bed, transferred me, and it was amazing. So, uh, so we used hypnosis for uh, healing. I find that, you know, if we have stress, if we have anxiety, if we have insomnia, if we are in fear, if we have chronic pain, Hypnosis can work very well for all these things. So I, I've used hypnosis uh, regularly. And I, on my website, uh, I can mention, I guess, davidrippy.com. I put on 14 recordings from uh, covering all those things I just mentioned, from insomnia to pain to stress, anxiety. And I think that, I think that what we'll find is that if people take the time to listen to some of these guided meditations, that they'll, they'll be able to do it on their own. Anybody can do it. And allow yourself to go down into a, you know, a nice, relaxed state. And that state is pretty much called the theta state. There's four states of uh, relaxation. One's the beta state where you're not relaxed. You're like what we're doing now, Constance. We're talking, we're working, mm-hmm. we're thinking. Alpha is kind of that state to where, you know, you might be looking at a fish tank. Very relaxing. You're looking at a fire. You're watching the, beat, the waves crash on the beach. That's an alpha state. Fate is that state we've experienced right before we fall asleep, or we're sort of in that in-between realm. And the same with waking up. When we come out of a dream, we come out of a, or a deep sleep, and we wake up, the alarm goes off, bang, we turn it off, that's that theta state. So the best time to take advantage of this, obviously, is we're in a theta state, because a lot of us obviously don't have time during the day to sit around and meditate. So when you're laying there, instead of hitting that snooze alarm for an extra five minutes, what I suggest is take that time, you know, relax, allow your body just to relax. And what they find at Harvard, if we just do mindful meditation studies, we're talking of only 20 minutes a day for six weeks. When they did MRI studies, they looked at the participants prior to the meditation study for six weeks, 20 minutes a day, that's all. And they found that their brain matter, their gray area in their brain as well as the glial cells expanded from only six weeks of meditation so i think what it, it'll do two things for you one it will uh, move your life forward and second it will find find you that inner peace that's hard to find in today's world you know with everything going on well that's so good you know i know with the law of attraction uh, a lot of people understand that uh, you know whatever they're believing for or whatever their desired manifestation is that it's just before they go to sleep if they would uh get in the theta state i think is the correct one that uh and live from the end of their desires it really imprints their subconscious more powerfully uh, causes are exactly right. And what happens, what's interesting about the law of attraction, if we look at what rules our world, it doesn't, or you know, I should, I should say universe because they're the universal laws. Uh, it doesn't matter what religion you are. It doesn't matter what political party you belong to. It doesn't matter the color of our skin. It doesn't matter what we like to eat or drink, what dogs we like. What the universal laws does, it runs all our lives. And the law of attraction falls under that third law called the law of vibration. So everything vibrates, and when we throw out positive thoughts into the universe, you know, we, you know, send love out, send out peace, send out you know areas that are war torn or uh, suffering uh, worse than we are as far as starvation and such. You know, if we throw out these positive vibes, these vibrations that you know kind of quell some of the negativity, quell some of the fear on TV. And I think that's what the best thing to do is, you know what? We all can turn on our TVs and normally about 90% of the programming is not very good, not very positive. If we turn that TV off, do something we enjoy to do. Find a creative outlet during this time of uncertainty. 
And I like to look at it as like a hurricane or, you know, we, we're in a hurricane. We're, you know, we can, uh, we can either be caught up in it or we can stay in the middle of the sweet spot and just kind of float around and visualize everything going on around us without allowing us to absorb us or sweep us into it. So that's the key. You want to maintain that calm, that presence, and let things swirl around us as they will. That's what life on earth is. It's a lot of challenges, a lot of events, a lot of unexpected things. And if we can allow ourselves to stay in that sweet spot by staying more relaxed, go out in nature, take a walk, breathe the air, exercise, run if you can do it. You know, take advantage of these moments. Do things you enjoy to do. Find your creative outlets. We all have things we like to do. You know, it could be uh, painting, it could be drawing, it could be writing, it could be, uh, you know, running, whatever. But find these outlets, do them, come back, occasionally sit back in that theta state early morning, late at night, and just sit back and just kind of relax. Allow your body just to wind down. And we'll see, you'll see remarkable improvements. And at that time when you wind down, that's the time to say, you know, Maybe I'd like to switch careers. The business that I'm running now is getting impacted by COVID. Let me maybe think of maybe doing this. And then in your mind, picture that goal, that big event, that, that career move, and then work your way backwards. What little goals or steps do I have to set to be competitive enough, you know, to get a job in this field, to realize that dream? And you got to be realistic. I mean, uh, you know, I think some people aren't as realistic as they maybe should be. In other words, there might be a situation where, you know, they have that dream to own their own business, their own restaurant, and they got to borrow lots of money to do it. And, you know, next thing you know, we get smacked with COVID unexpectedly in February, and all those poor guys that started their restaurant or business a year earlier are struggling now. So we have to look and say, hey, if we have, you know, once we get through this uh, COVID situation, is my business going to return to where it was? Do I need to consider ways to add to the business to make it more fit in with today's paradigm of Zoom type behavior? What do I need to do with this brick and mortar building? Do I really need to have the employees here or should we have it home and Zoom and you know, raise the bottom line numbers up by uh, not paying the rent anymore on this building we don't really need, we, we can't go to anyway with COVID. So I think there's things we need to look at. I think if we can objectively sit back Find that theta state, allow our bodies to minds to relax. I think we can move forward and we just got to not allow the event to absorb us. We can't allow it to just run into our hearts and sit there and fester. We need to move the negative energy out of us. We need to exert that positive energy. We need to reach out, pray, pray to, um, you know, pray to uh, the gods in your religion, allow yourself to relax Bring in that golden light. Bring those angels in. Bring those spirit guides. Bring the people in them that it can help us move forward in this in this three dimensional world we live in. And I think by uh, by adopting that type of approach, setting goals and goals make us happy. If we have a goal and we accomplish a little bit of that goal that day, we don't feel as stagnant. We don't feel as sluggish as we do if we just sit around and you know, try to drown our sorrows in the latest Netflix series or something. Oh, that ain't nothing but the truth. You know, and this is my last question to you, David. What do you do on days or do you ever have days where you're like, ugh, this is too much or I'm just not motivated or what is life about? Do you ever have those days? And if you do, what do I you do? do? I wouldn't sound like a real person. if I. <laughs> it would sound like, who is this robot we're talking to? <laughs> You know, somebody programming on positive, that's the only speed he knows. No, conscious, no. I, uh, I, I was bored yesterday. I felt bored. Oh, I did mean, you? Uh, mm-hmm. You know, the summer was uh, winding down. Labor Day's over. I didn't get to go down. We, we a lot of times, uh, those that live, you know, outside of Philadelphia, we tend to go to, the, like, the Jersey Shore, the Delaware beaches, Maryland. You know, get out to the water, kind of like you guys might do to the Gulf. You know, get down there, enjoy it a little bit. I like boats and water and uh, – you know, that was, that was uh, curtailed this year because of uh, the virus and not wanting to stay in hotels and take a chance. So that, that made it more difficult because it's about two hours away. You know, it's not, you know, it's a what you can do in one day, but it's not as fun as if you just spread it out over two days or three days. So, yeah, I was a little bored. And, um, you know, I find I didn't feel like, uh, you know, I, didn't, I thought, you know what, I'm bored, but 
let's do something. Let's, you know, that's the state of mind. Mm-hmm. Let's see what, let's change this a little bit. So then I went back and I dug up a book that I'd started about a couple of years, you know, two or three years ago. I only had about 40, 50 pages into it. And, uh, you know, I thought, let's go open that up. Let's update it to at least today's date. Maybe read through it a little bit. Maybe even we only had a sentence or two. Not, we don't even have to write a whole paragraph or a whole chapter. But let's just do that. And, it, you know, it, like, like I said, Confucius said, it doesn't matter how slow you go. Some days you're going to drag. Some days you're just not going to feel like doing anything. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with it. Our bodies need time to relax. We can't constantly be working or, you know, trying to calculate positive goals and ideas. So it's good to sit back and, um, you know, take, that's when you take that time, that walk in the woods, that wheel around the neighborhood, uh, breathe in that air. And, um, you know, allow yourself that time to relax, you know, work, uh, earth, you know, living here on earth isn't all work all the time, but, you know, play. But I think the main thing is, uh, we don't want to overplay. We got to keep it balanced. Mm-hmm. What I mean by that is like what Buddha said, take the middle path. You know, don't be the guy that sits around depressed and maybe turning to horrible substances to get through that day. Don't be the guy that's constantly working so hard. You just don't really smell a rose and enjoy life or understanding beyond your job. You know, find that place in the middle to where you kind of, you know, relax, but you can also get work done and just keep moving forward, not living at one extreme or the other. I love it. I love it. So, David, you're just a wealth of knowledge. I'm so glad we connected. Uh, Tell listeners your website. How can they get your books? Are you available to speak? Do you coach, et cetera? Well, constantly, my website is davidrippy.com, D-A-V-I-D, Rippy, R-I-P-P-Y.com. They can go on there. Like I mentioned, I, the meditations or guided meditations are free. Go on there if you have pain, if you have insomnia, if you have fear, anxiety, or if you just want to rest your mind and try to think, you know, think of things, um, you know, use one of those. The books are on there as well. You can also get them on Amazon. That's probably your easiest, best bet. You know, they're on Barnes and Open. Amazon is easier. Um, yeah, there's different shows we get involved in. I don't, I do coaching, but more on a, you know, more on a group basis. And, I got you. Uh, yeah, I, I am. I have more time for that now. Uh, I do do hypnosis. I do it, uh, you know, for pain and things like that. That's not, you know, not as much on an individual basis. But uh, you know, if somebody's out there really badly suffering. Send me an email and. Uh, you know, if you're, you've got a traumatic disease or something or cancer, uh, reach out and we'll see what you can do. Thank you so much. Hey, David, this was worth the wait. <laughs> worth, no, the reschedule- <laughs> worth the rescheduling. And um, you've just shared a wealth of information. And listeners, I'm going to strongly encourage you to make sure that you visit uh, David's uh, website. Uh, I love your spirit. I love your energy, David. And you are a blessing to the world. Well, you are too, Constance, because through your uh, station, obviously, you reach a lot of people and uh, bring a lot of love and hope. I do. That's what it's all about. And everybody, uh, remember to visit my website, fulfillingyourpurpose.com. And as I say every week, you may not know it or even feel it, but you are surrounded by a loving, giving, supported spirit. And I want you to think, feel, believe, and say something good is going to happen to me and through me for others this week. Have a great week, everybody. Thank you for listening to Think, Believe, and Manifest. Constance Arnold will be back next week with another great show just for you. For more information, please visit fulfillingyourpurpose.com.